Hey, it's Doug with Backcountry Pilgrim. Let's talk about getting into hiking. If you or someone you know is looking to get into hiking, or maybe you were into hiking some time back, but it's been a while, this would be a good video to help you get started, especially with gearing up for your first hike. To begin with, let's talk about clothing. The first general principle you wanna follow when it comes to hiking clothing is to generally avoid cotton. Cotton is very comfortable, it feels very soft, but the problem with it is that it retains moisture for a very long time. And that means that if it's cold and you get wet, either through rain or melted snow or sweat, it's going to cling to you and drop your body temperature. Further, even if it's warm and having wet clothing is something of a comfort, as you're hiking, it can lead to chafing, a skin condition which is very, very uncomfortable and can absolutely ruin a hike. Now the options for avoiding cotton typically are some kind of synthetic or some kind of wool. The nice thing about synthetic is that it is generally inexpensive, it can be very lightweight and comfortable, and it does not hang on to moisture very well. One of the downsides of synthetic is that it does tend to hang on to your stink. So if you or those around you are sensitive to body odor, synthetic may not be the best way to go. Now wool, especially merino or alpaca type wools, are typically better all the way around, except in the price area. You're typically going to pay a premium for a wool product. However, it's gonna give you the best of both worlds. It's not gonna hang on to moisture, it's not gonna hang on to stink, and it can also be very comfortable. The next general principle about hiking clothing is that you want to think in layers. A big heavy coat in winter is fine if you're just walking from your door to your car or your car to the office. However, out in the backcountry, it's usually gonna be way too much. Your body is gonna be generating a lot of heat while you're hiking, and you aren't going to be able to release any of that to avoid sweating out your clothes if you've got a big giant coat on. Now, I've done a whole video on this that I will link to at the end of the video, but layering starts with a base layer. This is the layer of clothing that's actually in contact with your skin. What you really want here is something light, clingy, and something that can wick water or moisture off of your body so that whatever moisture is inside your clothing system isn't lying right on your skin. Beyond the base layer, you want to have at the ready, even if you're not wearing it at the time of your hike, an insulation layer. So this is going to be some kind of down or synthetic fill that traps air between your body and the outside temperatures. And that air that is trapped will be warmed by your body and not simply blown off into the wind. A synthetic insulation layer is again going to be fairly inexpensive. It also does a lot better if it gets wet. A down-filled insulation layer is the best for weight savings and compressibility but if it gets wet, it's basically useless. On top of the insulation layer, you want your rain layer. This is something that is gonna keep water from getting onto you from the outside. Now, the bad news with a rain layer is that the really high-tech materials like Gore-Tex are expensive. And to be honest, most of them do not live up to the kinds of claims they make about allowing internal moisture to evaporate out while keeping external moisture from coming in. So the good news is that cheap is fine when it comes to rain layers. No, they may not be that breathable. You may have to deal with more sweat. But for me, I would put more of my money into the internal layer that keeps the sweat off of me than trying to find a layer that is going to allegedly keep it from collecting. Now, you might have noticed I am wearing a Gore-Tex jacket right now. However, the one that I typically keep with me that is a pure rain layer and has pretty much no insulating powers whatsoever is one of the cheapest you can get on the market. I will put links below in the video description to the gear that I typically take. Now beyond the jacket, you're also going to want to have something covering the bottom. You can go with rain pants, which are basically a rain jacket for your legs, or you can go with something like a kilt, which will keep the moisture off about three quarters of you and allow a lot more breathability so that you're not sweating out. My one extra piece of advice for rain layers is that the more zippers you have that will allow ventilation to come through, the better. This one right here can actually unzip from the pit all the way to the bottom, basically turning this into a big poncho. Venting is always going to do a better job of controlling your temperature 
and your moisture levels than the material that the jacket is made of. All right, next let's talk about footwear. It might seem like if you're going on a hike that hiking boots would be the most logical thing to get. However, most hiking boots are really overbuilt, and if they're not, if they're cheap and not very well made, they're not gonna even do what they were made for in the first place. Most hikers today, unless they are in very rugged territory or carrying very heavy packs, are just gonna opt for basically a tennis shoe. The perfect mix right now seems to be a trail runner. This is basically a tennis shoe with some of the properties of a hiking boot, such as better treads and more ventilation. Your base layer can be a wicking sock, maybe a toe sock that actually keeps the skin from touching inside your toes, and then a cushioned sock over that. That is gonna be one of the best ways to keep you blister free on your hike. Next, you wanna probably bring some sunglasses or whatever you need for your eye care, as well as a pair of gloves, depending on the weather. I usually like to wear a brimmed hat because it is less insulative than a hood. And if I have to put the hood on, the brim will keep the hood from dropping down and blocking my vision. Okay, let's move on to gear. This is not the stuff you're wearing on your body, but that you're carrying. Now you will see various 10 essentials lists out there. It's difficult to find two that match, but there are some general trends that tell you the kinds of things you really should have if you're going on any kind of a serious hike out in the backcountry. So don't get hung up on the number, but here are my 10 and the way I think of them. The first one is hydration. You're going to want to find some way to carry water or some kind of mixed drink with you into the backcountry. And whether that is a bladder that connects to your mouth with a hose that you carry in your backpack or a bottle that you carry in a bottle carrier, that's gonna be up to you. I also have a video on that that I will link to below. Another important feature of hydration is the ability to refill whatever system you're bringing with you. Now in the back country, you might see beautiful creeks like the one behind me and think, oh, the water is so clear and beautiful. Well, the problem is the stuff that will actually make you sick is typically not visible. So what you're going to want is some kind of water filtration system or purification system. That is another video as well. In addition to hydration, you want some nutrition. If you end up being out longer than expected, it is good to be able to keep your calories and your energy up. So you wanna bring some snacks, you wanna bring some things that are gonna fuel you to get you through your hike. Next is navigation. Even if you think you know where you're going, it's a good idea to make sure that you have something that is not phone dependent that will get you where you need to go. Learning how to use a map and compass is a fun skill and it's one that is irreplaceable in the outdoors just in case this thing dies or stops working. Next is illumination. You might have only planned on a day hike, but if something happens to you that makes you take longer to get out, it could get dark. It typically gets dark faster in the mountains, especially if you're down low under the mountains than it does in the city. Plus, you never know when you're gonna find a cool cave or something that's gonna require you to have a headlamp or a flashlight to navigate it. So you always want to have the ability to illuminate for at least one full night. And if that means bringing backup batteries or a charger block, make sure you have it ready. Next, we have various things in the category of protection. What are the kinds of things in the backcountry that you might need to be protected from? Well, conveniently, the sun just came out from behind a cloud, and that reminds me that I'm probably gonna need protection from that. During a hike, you're gonna get a lot more sun exposure than you typically do during the day, and so some kind of sunscreen or a hooded hat or something to keep the sun from blistering up your skin is definitely a good idea. Also, obviously outside is where the bugs live. You're probably going to want some kind of chemical that you can put on your skin, something you can put on your clothes, they are not usually the same thing. Or my personal favorite is just a simple bug net. This can totally change the enjoyment level of your hike. Now, if you're going somewhere where the critters get a little bit bigger than bugs, you might wanna also consider carrying an air horn or even bear spray. Make sure you check your local regulations before you throw on that can of bear spray. It's not allowed in many places. And if there is anything else you feel like carrying for protection, you might wanna check on that too. Next, we have the category of health. This is going to be your emergency first aid kit and any particular medicines or things that you yourself need to keep safe. 
Don't overdo it on the first aid. Don't carry anything that you don't know what it's for. If you're not an EMT, you don't really need a whole lot more than that. In addition to first aid, emergency gear should also include some way to signal for help. A satellite communicator is very good for this in a number of ways. This is not only good for sending out an SOS message if you get in real trouble, but it also just lets you communicate with people back home in case your plans change. One thing that I always keep in my emergency kit is some way to make fire. Besides the obvious benefit of keeping warm, it can also be used as a signal, it can be used to purify water, to help you cook, etc. So even if you're not planning on cooking in the outdoors, it's good to have a lighter or some kind of fire starter that you know how to use in your emergency kit. Related to health is a bathroom kit. If you have to go to the bathroom in the backcountry, there are various devices to make it more comfortable, whether it's number one or number two. But if it is number two, you're going to want a poop kit. This is going to include a trowel that's going to allow you to dig what's called a cat hole. That's where it's gonna go. And then either some toilet paper, wet wipes, dehydrated wet wipes, something to clean yourself up. You also carry a good solid Ziploc bag because everything but your poop should be being packed out with you. Now, pretty much every 10 essentials list that I have ever seen includes a knife. And whether that's a big old camp knife or just a little tiny pocket knife, a knife can be very useful in the backcountry. But do keep in mind, what are you actually going to use it for? If you're not going to be out bushcrafting, you don't need a big giant Daniel Boone Bowie knife hanging off of your belt. Finally, some kind of shelter system is not a bad idea if you think there's any possibility that you're going to be accidentally spending the night in the backcountry. And this can be anything from a very small emergency bivy bag to a full tent. They make these out of mylar and they're very lightweight and they come packed very small. There's no reason not to have one of these in your kit. However, if you want to up your game a little bit, carrying a tarp with some cordage and knowing what to do with it can also be very helpful, possibly even a lifesaver if you're in the outdoors when you didn't think you were going to be. And that brings us to the essential of all essentials, the backpack, the thing you're going to carry this gear in. I saved backpack for last because until you know how much gear you're going to be bringing with you, you don't really know how big the backpack needs to be. Keep in mind that there are a couple of different ways that backpack sizes are spoken of. Typically, the backpack size has to do with how it relates to the size of your torso length. That's something you're going to want to know if you get into a more advanced backpack. However, for a simple day pack, what you really want to look at is volume. How much stuff can I fit in a pack? Typically, a day pack can be around 20 liters, maybe 30 in the winter if you've really got a lot of extra stuff you're carrying. You want to kind of go as lightweight as possible. Spend some time shopping packs. Try them on. See what feels comfortable. Think about where you're going to pack everything and if it's going to go where you want it to go. Personally, I don't like a whole lot of additional pockets. However, I do prefer a lot of external storage so that I can get to things that I might need quickly right away without having to undo the whole pack to get to it. A comfortable backpack that carries gear where you want it carried can really make for a much more pleasant hiking experience. A couple of other items you might want to consider are trekking poles. Trekking poles are extendable, lightweight poles that help with balance, they help with moving yourself forward, they can help with creek crossings, setting up a tarp, knocking branches out of your way. They are very useful for any number of things, however, they do have to be carried. If you think you're going to use trekking poles, you might want to check and make sure that your backpack has a good place to put them for when you don't want them. Technology-wise, you're probably going to have your phone with you and some earbuds in case you want to listen to music or a book or something while you're hiking. Don't be one of those douchebags that brings a Bluetooth speaker on the trail. Nobody is out here to listen to your jams. Don't force them to. You also might want to think about bringing a charger block in case your batteries die. You might consider an ultralight umbrella, which is good for both rain and sun exposure. I would highly recommend a buff. I keep one of these with me on every hike. And you can also look at an ultralight sit pad or even a camp chair that will allow you to sit comfortably when you get where you're going so that you're not trying to find a rock or some muddy spot to sit down in that messes up your clothes or messes up your gear. Oh, and one more thing before I let you go. Keep in mind that the most important piece of gear on the trail is your mind. If you don't know how this gear works, if you don't understand some basics of being in the outdoors, it's not going to do you a lot of good and can even give you 
a false confidence that could get you into trouble. So my advice is to start with something easy, start with something you can't get in much trouble with, and just gradually work your way up before you start doing some big bomber hikes out in the backcountry. All right, well, that is the basics of gearing up for your first hike. I have links to videos in the description below on the gear that I use, and I've also got links to videos that go into a deeper dive into why you might want it. If this video has been helpful, why don't you give it a like and subscribe to Backcountry Pilgrim. If you're into hiking, camping, backpacking, and the gear that goes with it, even if you're just getting into those things. And until next time, I'm Doug. Thank you for watching.